to the class. Okay. All right. So I must share, confess that I spent quite some time deliberating or agonizing as to which sikha to learn. We're following this uh, amazing project called Project Lukut Sikhas. Um, you see here, um, this is their website. And each week there's two sikhas. So you click here for one and here for two. And I'll just demonstrate to those watching on the screen. Let's say if we choose number two, you go, it opens up another page where there's a tremendous amount of resources, audio, um, video, additional style. These are in Hebrew, Yiddish, English, Spanish, Portuguese. And then there's all sorts of other materials, translation, hey, Russian source sheets, you know, all, for all sorts of levels. You have 10 minute podcasts, you have 45 minute podcasts, you have 88 minute videos. There's all good stuff going on over here. And I did, so I was uncertain as to what to do because this week, the first sikha which they chose is Vayishlach Yutis Kislev, which is more of a Chassidah style sikha um, and certainly fits well with the atmosphere of um, this time of year as we're preparing for Yutis Kislev and uh, Kislev being such a month where we emphasize the Chassidah Shayyamim Toivim and Chassidahs. So I was very drawn to learning that sikh together, but then ultimately prevailed the second choice. Now the second choice is similar to what we did last week. It is a Rashi sikh, and in, in, in a certain sense, even more um, technical in, in, in a way than the, the one we did last week. Um, and it's a struggle. How do we, I, I, well, first I'll say the positive. The positive is the reason why I decided this one is because I, I so much enjoy the Rashi Sikhas and it's schmack and brilliant and there's, there's something really powerful that I enjoy so much and I really um, hope and strive that I'm able to share it in a way that those joining me and learning this together will also can also develop that enjoyment and that passion for these Sikhas. Um, the, the challenge that I have is that it's sometimes difficult, and especially if people don't have so much background in learning Gemara, that type of an, a, 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 um, being analytical through texts, um, that it's difficult to convey this without getting too sort of um, overwhelmed by the detail. So hopefully with practice I get better at it, and hopefully you give me good feedback and you tell me if I'm the right direction or not. Anyway, so without further ado, so the psukim that we're going to focus on right now are in, if you, those who are following in the actual Chumash, if you turn to... It's uh -oh. in the, who's saying uh-oh? Um, Jay? Oh, that, yeah, that was me. I guess I'm on mute. I just lost the visual. So, but go it. ahead. I can go ahead. I'll figure it. I can hear you. All right. You, you can't see the screen? No, it's my phone. Uh, I'll figure it out. I know. Okay. You, I trust you. All right. So let's look at the psukim over here. It's in this week's parsha, Genesis chapter thirty-six, um, and we're going to go to pasuk six. So this is after six and seven. So after this is after Yaakov. At the beginning of the parsha, Yaakov confront they they encounter each other. Yaakov confronts him. He gives them all the gifts. They kind of make peace. And they go back, they all go to look back to the land of Canaan, currently the land of Israel. Then later on in, chap in this chapter, we start talking about Esau's family. And the Torah says as follows. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughter, all the people of his household. And then his animals. That's called Behemtoi. And his cattle, that's called Behemtoi, all his animals, that's called Kinyone, and all his properties that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, Asherach Hashbaz Canaan, he acquired in the land of Canaan, Vayelach El Eretz, and he went to another land, Mipnei Yaakov Achiv, because of his brother Jacob. Pasuk 7, Zayin, Kihoye Rechusham Rav Mishavas Yaakov, for their possessions were too numerous for them to dwell together. And the land of their sojournings, and the land of their sojournings could not support them, or I would actually translate that word. We'll see more about this word in a minute. But I would say a better translation would be the land of their um, sojournings could not contain them. 
because of the livestock. Now, before we um, open up the Rashi over here to see what Rashi says on these psukim, what do you, my friends, think these psukim are saying? What, what, paraphrase, Bob, what does these psukim say? How do you understand this? What's going on? On the uh, surface level, it just basically says there's too much livestock and cattle if there's not enough pasture and room for them to eat and live and survive together. Perfect, exactly. It seems to be very simple. Um, there's, they, 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 there's a lot of cattle going on over here. Um, there doesn't seem to be enough um, pasture for all the animals to graze. So somebody's got to leave. So Asaph picks up, he takes all his family and his cattle and all his property, and he goes to another land. Where does he go? So Apostle Ches tells us where he went. Vayeshev Esav Behar Seir Esav Hu Edoim Esav dwelt on the Mount of Seir. Now those of you who are, before we open the Rashi, those of you who are experts on um, scripture will be familiar with the fact that Esav is not a straight, that Esav, Jay, is everything okay over there? I'm, uh, I can hear everything. I just lost the video, so. All right, no, I just, there was yeah. some noise, but I'm just going to, I'm going to mute everybody, and if you, you're welcome to unmute yourselves, um, I'm just, there seems to be some background noise, okay, so now um, I'm going to point something out, those of you, uh, it may sound familiar, here it says that Esau went to dwell in Seir, so he went to another land, and verse 6 tells us he went to another land, verse 8 tells us where that other land was, it was Seir, now, um, Esau is not a stranger to Seir. Esau has been to Seir before. Um, let me just find the reference. Hold on. Um, in, if we go here to uh, chapter 33, which is earlier on in this week's parasha, you'll see that Esau has already been to Seir before. He, he, he frequents Seir. Um, this is in chapter 33, verse 16, where it says, Yashav by Seira, Esau returned on that day to his, on his way to Seir, or really it should be to his way to Seir. In other words, he frequented there. And perhaps one of the reasons he frequented there was because as um, Esau is described in, in, in early on in chapter 25 as being an Ish Sodeh, a man of the field. Um, and there's lots of fields in Seir, as the verse says, um, also in uh, uh, chapter 25. Arts of Seir, Sedei Edom, the land of Seir, with the fields of Edom. So Esau, being a man who has a lot of business in the field, who's a man of the field, as the Torah describes him, um, it makes sense that he has his second home, that he has his, you know, his, his, his hobby of going to Seir. So Esau has always had a fond, fondness for Seir. So now that Yaakov's pasture pushes him out of the land of Canaan, he finally takes the plunge and actually makes the move um, to Seir. Okay, very simple. Now let's open up the Rashi. So you go here and you click show Rashi's commentary. Let's see what Rashi has to say on these verses. So on verse, um, verse seven, Rashi quotes the word Velo Yochla Eretz Megurehem. The land of their sojourning was not able to. Um, and Rashi says as follows It was not able to provide sufficient pasture for their animals. Right? So that's the first, we have to sort of break up this Rashi. That's the first Rashi. The, the land of their sojournings could not provide sufficient pasture for their animals. What's Rashi saying? Rashi doesn't seem to be saying anything that's not explicit in the Pasuk, right? The Pasuk says, the Pasuk already said, um, 
the, the land of their sojournings could not contain them because of their livestock. The Pasuk used the word miknehem, which means livestock, and Rashi changes that word to behemoth, to their animals. Now, why does Rashi need to translate the word miknehem? Seems a bit odd. I mean, we know what the word miknehem is. That word appears numerous times in the Torah um, beforehand, and Rashi saw no reason to um, to, uh, to to translate that word for us. So again, Rashi, one of the principles of Rashi is that Rashi is talking to somebody who has is ben chomish mikra, so he has certain whatever he has certain skills and is very systematic. So if Rashi doesn't translate a word the first time we encounter it, um, that means that that word need not be translated. The child knows what it means. So then if Rashi does translate it the second time, we have to understand why. Now, just one example. If you look in Genesis and Pashas Lech Lecha, where we have a similar story of the land not being able to contain two people because there was too much cattle. In that case, it was Avraham and his nephew Light. So in chapter 13, verse 7, there Rashi says, There wasn't enough pasture for them. Miknehem. So there, where the Pasuk doesn't use the word Miknehem, Rashi uses the word Miknehem for their cattle. And by us, the Pasuk says there was not enough for their cattle, and somehow it's not good enough. And Rashi translates it into sort of more simple words, could not provide sufficient pasture for their animals. So what's going on over here? What is, what is bothering Rashi? Then Rashi continues. The Medrash Agada, however, explains, because of his brothers, Jacob, right? Now, this, the words, because of his brother, Jacob, are a direct quote from the previous Pasuk. At the end of Pasuk 7, Pasuk Zion, it says he went to another land because of his brother, Jacob. So even though these are words from the from Pasuk 6, Rashi is bringing this Medrash on Pasuk 7 for some reason, but he quotes these words because of his brother, Jacob, and it says, because, as, because of the... Um, because of the note of obligation of the decree that your seed will be strangers, which was put upon the descendants of Yitzchak. He, namely Esau, said, I will get out of here. I have neither a share in the gift in the, um, for the land has been given to him, nor in the payment of the debt. He left also an account of the shame that he felt because he had sold his birthright. Okay, somewhat of a rough translation. I'll just uh, explain the translation and then we'll unpack this. Um, the Medrash Agada, the Medrash that Rashi is quoting over here, is saying that there was another reason why Esau left, and that is because of Yaakov, his brother, as alluded to in the previous Pasuk, Pasuk 6, and that is Esau, sorry, Yaakov had received the blessings from his, their father Yitzchak, and Yitzchak had told him that you're going, sorry, not Yitzchak, um, Avram, ha, Hashem had told Avram, you know, at the Brisbane, I'm sorry, the covenant, Hashem had told to Avram that your children, namely the descendants of Yitzchak, will be strangers in a foreign land, which of course ultimately was fulfilled when the Yaakov and his family went to Mitzrayim. And, um, and, and then they're going to be put into slavery and be, have a lot of suffering. And afterwards, they're going to come back to this land with great wealth. So the Medrash says that, you know why Esau left the land of Canaan and went to Seir? Because he said, I don't want to have to take part in paying the, what, he, what Rashi is calling, calling the debt. I don't want to have to take part in this living in a foreign land and suffering, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I, so, so, that, so I'm going to make sure I don't take part in the reward of living in the land of Canaan. And then I won't have to pay the price and I won't get the benefit. And I prefer it that way. And then Rashi adds on, in other words, and um, also on account of the shame that he felt because he had sold his birthright. So this was another reason... Um, Somehow, because he had sold his birthright, um, um, he was embarrassed to stay, and he left. So again, there's, there's many questions that we could ask on the Russian, and we'll go through some of them soon. But 
the, the, the prime question is, what's going on over here? The, the puzzle seems to make a lot of sense. The puzzle says that Asaph have left because there wasn't enough pasture to go around for the animals, so there wasn't enough, so somebody had to leave. So why is Rashi see it necessary? We know Rashi, there's a few principles. One is that Rashi only brings a medrash when there's something wrong with the simple, with the pshat, when, when the simple, obvious interpretation of the pasuk is, has a problem, then we bring a medrash to supplement that. What, what's the problem with the pasuk that Rashi seems to be a medrash? Also, Rashi only brings a medrash, even when he does bring a medrash, Rashi says explicitly that he only brings a medrash, which is dover dover loifnav, which, uh, which it, it's not the simple chat, but it's a medrash that fits the, into the pasuk neatly. Here, the medrash doesn't seem to fit into the pasuk at all. The, med, the pasuk says one reason why Esav left, and the medrash is giving two other reasons, because of his embarrassment, because of uh, um, he didn't want to take part in this whole debt and reward of living in a foreign land and getting this land, and because he was ashamed of having sold the birthright, which are all very nice things, but they don't seem to be related at all to what it says in the Pasuk. So there must be some real problem going on over here that Rashi is trying to address, and when we understand that problem, we could see how Rashi is addressing it with all of these things. So... The basic um, problem that Rashi is coming to address is that when you say that there's too much animals, too many animals, and there's not enough pasture to go around, so somebody has to leave. Why should that somebody be Asaph? Why would Asaph leave? The Pasuk, the, the reason that the Pasuk says, just says, someone has to leave. So why would that someone be Asaph? Certainly, um, it would make more sense for it to be Yaakov. Esav has been living here his whole life. He's the one who's kind of got his stronghold over there. Yaakov has just come back from Haran. He's been living in Haran for the last 20 years, plus the travel time and the 14 years. Yaakov hasn't been in the land of Canaan for more than 35 years. So suddenly he comes, and the, now there's not enough pasture to go. So Esav says, okay, goodbye. Like, it would seem to be, and you know, isn't known to be the most generous, um, th thoughtful, considerate person. Yaakov doesn't even ask him to leave. There doesn't seem to be any record of, it, it seems as if um, there wasn't enough. So completely un unchallenged and unconfronted, Esau just gets up, and gets up and leaves. So that is the glaring um, gap in the narrative that Rashi is bothered by and... Um, and, and he's coming to address over here. So Rashi first with the pshat. In other words, the first comment that Rashi says is from a pshat level. A pshat is a very difficult word to translate because we often translate it as simple, but it doesn't. Simple, simple. Sometimes you, know, you say the word simple, and we don't mean simple as an unsophisticated. We mean simple as in the the the. The, the literal translation of the words and you know without having to resort to esoteric and other uh, other means true but it's a different school it's a different study there's one study of chat and another study of Jewish. there are two different parts of torah and rashi's commentary is i'm going to teach you how to study the torah from a chat level and there's another there's studying from a drash level is another it's a, it's just as an it's, it's 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 equally important and equally true and equally part of torah but that's not that that's a different discipline and so rashi only draws on that discipline when there's something in the pshat discipline that that that's that's missing so the first comment rashi says is and is that he adds these words it could not provide sufficient pasture for their animals. And again, remember we pointed out, it seems to be just mirroring or translating what's already explicit in the Pasuk, what's going on over here. However, if you look carefully, um, there may be 
another way to understand the Pasuk, which Rashi is coming to um, preempt. And, um, and 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 that that also will give some explanation, indication as to why it was Asaph specifically who left and not Yaakov. Um, and that is as follows: If you go back to Pasuk again, we're on chapter what is this, thirty-six, verse. What did Asaph take? He took his wives, his sons, daughters, all his household, and then it says his cattle, which is this word. Miknehu that Rashi um, translates to Behemoth, right? He took his cattle and all his animals. Sorry, not I'm sorry, Rashi is trying the next puzzle. Right? He took his cattle, all his animals, and all his property, that the last of the three things is his property, that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and he went to another land because of his brother Jacob. And then in verse six, it's uh, in verse seven. It says, "For their possessions were too numerous for them to dwell together." Now, when we say here the word possessions, which possessions are we referring to? Anyone want to guess? Well, you could say the cattle, but perhaps if you're just reading this at face value, we said cattle, animals, all his property, all his property that he acquired, and then we said the possessions were too numerous. So their possessions were too numerous isn't specific, isn't referring specifically to the cattle. It's referring to all their property. They both had a huge estate, and there was no there was no room for two huge estates to coexist over here. It doesn't have to specifically be referring to the animals. Now then the apostle continues and says, and the land of their sojournings could not support them or contain them because of their livestock. Now that word miknehem which we're translating as livestock, but the truth is that word miknehem has the same root as the word mikne to acquire. And therefore the word miknehem could have been translated as the land, the land couldn't contain them because of their, all the things they acquired because of their possessions. So the apostle does, even though miknehem usually means cattle, it's true, or livestock, but there is room to translate the word miknehem as their acquisitions, their estate. And you might let the pos the narrative kind of lends itself to that translation because that's what we're talking about. The last thing we said was all his property in verse six, and the beginning of verse seven again continues talking about all their possessions, rechusham, their possessions, which is, which by the way, that word rechusham possessions is the exact same word that we used at the end of verse six, asher rochash, which they possessed, which they acquired, right? So it, the, the, the narrative does seem to be indicating perhaps that we're talking about their possessions and not specifically their animals. And so Rashi comes and emphasizes, no, we're talking about their animals. Why is that? Why, how does Rashi know that? And why is that relevant? Who cares if it's because of their animals or because of their general estates? The answer is because if we know we're talking about animals, suddenly it makes sense to us why Esau is the one to leave and not Yaakov. Because what do we know about... Um, Esau's about Yaakov's fleet of cars. What do we know about his fleet of animals? Let's go back. Let's open up to verse, chapter 30, verse 43. Chapter 30, verse 43, is describing Yaakov's vast estates and uh, animals, and it says, sorry, hold on. Yeah, one second, that's the wrong, I gave you the wrong reference. Sorry, chapter 30, verse 43. Is that what he said? Yes. Right? It says, the man became exceedingly wealthy and he had prolific animals, many animals, and maid servants and and uh, and and manservants and camels and donkeys. 
says Rashi, prolific animals. The Hebrew word rabbis means that they were fruitful and multiplied. They, 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 um, yeah, they, they had, they multiple fruitful, what's the word? They produced, whatever, um, much more reproduced, much more than other animals. So that's also how the maidservants and manservants comes in. Rashi says he would sell the animals at a high price and purchase all these for himself. So if we know that the reason that they couldn't coexist was not just generic because they had this big estate, but it was specifically because of their animals, then that's already the first indication that why it should be Aesov is the one to leave because Yaakov is the one who has such vast amount of cattle and not just regular cattle, cattle who are um, reproducing at uh, astro astronomic rate. So that is what gives us the indicator. Okay, so therefore Esau should be the one to leave. So that's the first part of the Rashi. Rashi says, and again, part of the beauty of what so what so what I find so geschmack about these sikhas is that you know you read this Rashi, it just seems like a regular Rashi. Like, well, okay, so he's translating the word. He brings a medrash. Did you even notice that he translated the word? Did you notice that he the medrash doesn't fit with the pasuk? Did you notice that um, in the middle of bringing the medrash, he quotes the words because of his brother Jacob that were a part, really part of the previous pasuk? Like you just read it and it's you know it's like word off a duck's back. You don't notice anything, and then you read the sicha and all and one after the other. Whoop, bang, bang, bang. How did you not notice that? And then the rabbi explains one shift of perspective, one thing, and suddenly everything falls into place. So here also, it starts off, the land of the Sojourning cannot provide sufficient pasture for their animals. Okay, Rosh is translating the puzzle. Did, no, the rabbi said that, no, it's not necessary to translate it. We know these words already. We've had these words before. Other times, Rashi didn't. But now that we know that there's a problem over here, Rashi is coming to address a problem. Why is it that Esau was the one to lead? So Rashi starts us by emphasizing the reason Esau is the one to lead is because the, pro cause, the cause of the problem was the animals. And once we're talking about animals, we know already from last week's parsha that Yaakov is the one with this huge, vast animal fleet of animals. And so it makes sense that Esau was the one to lead. Okay. However, this it's still not it's the still it's still a little bit problematic. Why? Because at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, it still sounds strange that just because Yaakov had so many um, animals, suddenly completely unchallenged and any you know without any protest, Esau suddenly became such a gentleman in his old age, and he says, "Okay, no problem, I'll leave." That doesn't seem to match the personality of the Esau we know. And so in order to address that issue, Rashi brings the Medrash. Now here's a very important point. And this actually is similar to an idea that we said last week when we spoke about the name of Ruvain, where the Medrash seems to be suggesting an alternative reason to that which it says in the Pasuk. But the way Rashi um, incorporates it in his commentary, we're not bringing an alternative thing. This, feeds into the reason of the Pasuk. The reason why Esav left is because there was too much livestock and it couldn't, it, it couldn't, it couldn't contain everyone. The Medrus is only there to, for, to, to, to sharpen the reason that the that's explicit in the Pasuk. In other words, the reason Esav left is because there was, not, there was too much. I, why did Esav leave and not Yaakov? Says the Medrus, there's another reason. And not that that reason would have made Esav leave because that reason existed for many years, right? In other words, the reason that the Medrash brings that because he didn't want to be part of this whole covenant of don't be a of being a stranger in another land and not taking um, part in the land. If if that was the reason the Esau left, why is he leaving now? He should have left 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? No, he, he didn't leave until now because he had no compelling reason to leave. Suddenly now there's a compelling reason for someone to leave, namely that there's not enough pasture to go around. And so because there's additional considerations, Esau chooses to be the one to leave. This consideration of not wanting to have to take part in paying the debt of, 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 thus, of, 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 of being a stranger in a, far, uh, in a far land and suffering and coming back. But that in and of itself wouldn't have been impetus for Esau to leave. It's only now that someone has to leave. So this is what sort of gives Esau, shall we say, the final straw that, okay, you know what? 
I think this is my, you know, this is my <laughs> practice. This is my cue that I should be the one to leave. And this way I save myself all the trouble. Okay, so now let's read the Medrash and see how this addresses the problem properly. And the Medrash gets its clue from the previous Pasuk. So Rashi quotes it in our Pasuk, because in our Pasuk is where Rashi is addressing it from a Pshat level, but the Medrash also picks up a, on a clue from a previous Pasuk, which says that he left, went to another land because of his brother Jacob. Why does the Pasuk see it necessary to emphasize the brotherhood? He went to another land because of Jacob, because, right, there wasn't enough, they, he went to another land, as the next verse says, because they couldn't, there wasn't enough pasture for the livestock. What's his brother Jacob got to do with anything? So the Medrash says, no, his brother Jacob is giving me a clue over here. His brother Jacob tells me that um, I don't want to be part of this. Uh, <coughs> of this, again, what, what, the thing that we're calling the debt and the reward. That's a familial thing. So the Torah adds in this word his brother Jacob because there's, there's this familial thing which, which is relevant. Now, again, this thing of Esau's, uh, of, of not wanting to take part in the land, uh, in, in the debt and in the reward, it, w it wasn't a reason for Esau to leave before now. Esau, it wasn't necessarily in his mind. And he, he wasn't living in the land sort of by, by do, doing anything proactive. He just happened to be living there. He didn't move away. That's where his, his starting point was. And it's only now that there's a reason for somebody to... To leave, so this was the last straw, which um, which propelled Asov to be the one to take action. Okay, then Rashi continues. Now, here's an interesting thing to point out. If you look, if you open up the source of Rashi, which is this Medrash, it says as follows. There is a Machlokas. Ever heard of Machlokas? There is a dispute. There are two opinions about, about this matter. Rabbi Laza says that the reason Esav leaves is because of this whole of the Shtar Chayv. Because of this not wanting to take part in the debt or in reaping their seeds of it. Rabbi Yeshua says because he was embarrassed, he was ashamed that here comes along Yaakov who um, who, um, who who sort of duped him or whatever, who Esav gave into and sold his birth, his his his, his uh, Firstborn rights to. So there's two different opinions. Rabbi Loza says he left for one reason, and Yeshua left he for, uh, says another reason. But if you look at Rashi, Rashi sort of just combines it all together. He says, um, the Medrash God says that he didn't want to leave because of the whole, you know, Shtar Chayv thing. And then Rashi adds, and also an account of the shame that he felt because he had sold his birthright. So Rashi doesn't see it as two different things. Rashi changes from the Medrash and puts it together into one. And again, Rashi is trying to make sense of the narrative. Rashi is saying, okay, so 
Esav sees that until now, Esav doesn't leave because whatever, he's just staying put. And the fact that he didn't proactively go, um, go and move to the land, he just um, happened to um, he just happened to still be living there. Um, Esau didn't feel was a contradiction to him not having to take part of the the decree of Gaulus of having to be in exile, you know, exiled in another nation. But now that there was a need for one of them to leave, Esau says, "Okay, this is my cue. And if now I sort of proactively stay and push the other one out, then maybe I'm going to be opting in to a bigger deal than I want to opt into." Okay, but it still seems a little bit out of character for Esav, who's this big macho guy who doesn't like to give in to anyone or anything, to say, to, 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 um, to sort of put himself through this humiliation. He's going to rock up in Sayer over there with his whole thing. And he says, yeah, you know, my brother Yaakov came and kicked me out. How does that make you, Mr. Big Man Esav feel, right? So therefore, Rashi says, no. That it's true that he may have been humiliating for him to have to show his face up in Sarah and say, yeah, you know what, I was kicked out and I'm, I'm moving up to my summer home and I had to sell my, you know, my, 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 my real house. But, but, the, but to counter that, there was also humiliation involved with Ace of staying put. And that's what Rashi adds, not as an alternative chat, but within the same address, again, just to further underscore, to make sense of the narrative. Why is Ace of the one to leave? Because in addition, to this calculation that he had of not have, wanting to have to take part of this deal with going into Golos. Um, just in case he was, you, he was worried about um, his, his reputation as being a powerful aluf, a so yeah, powerful man, um, being kicked out by his brother, the humiliation was the same over here because here, suddenly he's been living here for all these years alone as the big man, and suddenly comes his little brother over here who um, is reminding everyone, I'm the one who managed to get Esav to sell me the, the, the brachas from Yitzchak, and look, look what I've got. I've got this huge estate that's so big so and overshadowing Esav. So staying put was also humiliating to Esav, and therefore um, taking everything into account, it makes sense even from, from an Esav perspective, from the personality of Esav, the way we know him, that he be the one to leave. Okay, that's the end of the, the sort of the analytical part of the Sikha. And then the Rebbe finishes off the Sikha just to sort of just further clarify this last point. As far as Rashi is concerned, just because he had, a, he had, Rashi can't say as a sort of a separate independent reason that he left because he was embarrassed of his brother. That's not a reason to leave. The reason to leave is the reason that it says in the Pasuk, that there wasn't enough pasture. But as an additional depth of understanding the psychology of Esav, the humiliation fed into his decision making. So that ends the analytical part of the Sikha, of the Rashi, and again how a Rashi which you read the Pasuk, everything seems to make sense. You see the Rashi, everything seems to make sense. Then the Rebbe asks 75 questions or seven questions, and you say, hey, how, nothing in this Rashi makes any sense. And then we come up with the Rebbe presents one, one idea, and that sort of changes the whole, the whole picture, and everything falls neatly into place, and it's beautiful. Um, but there's still one point. Now, this, this Rashi Sikha is different than most of them. Most of the Rashi Sikha, like we mentioned last week, have an extensive Yeno Shaltaira, have an extensive part at the end, usually at least a couple of pages, which talk about um, uh, a lesson in Avedis Hashem. This Sikha, the lesson of Avedis Hashem is perhaps shorter, but certainly no less important. And let's read that. Um, if I hold on, I have the text. Here's the text. I'm sure if you, those who are following on the screen, um, we can see this is the translation of this Sikha into English. Um,
The following still needs to be clarified. Okay. The decree uh, imposed upon Yitzchak's offspring that your offspring will be strangers dictates that they will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, but not specifically in Egypt, as Rashi explains in his commentary in the verse um, elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, Rashi in, um, in Parshas Lech Lecha. Yeah, uh, we could even look it up quickly if we could find this. Hold on. Let me show you the verse. You open up to Genesis chapter 15, Parcel Gud Gimel. This is the Bisbein Hamasarim. This is the covenant between the pieces, I think they call it, um, where it says, he said, let me show the Rashi. He said to Avraham, you shall surely know that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And Rashi says, it does not say in the land of Egypt, but in the land that is not theirs, right? And therefore, it says that they're going to be for 400 years, even though they were only 210 years in Egypt, but they were for 400 years, they weren't firmly settled in the land of Israel, right? Um, from the time Isaac was born and Avram sojourned in the land, da, 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 so it makes sense the 400 years. So Esau, so, so, so the, the, the debt that Esau is trying to make sure he's not going to have any part in paying doesn't say that they're going to be um, strangers in Egypt. It says they're going to be in a foreign land. So how does Esau, um, as such, Esau moves to the Mount, Esau's move to Mount Seir outside the land of Canaan could also qualify as payment of the debt. In other words, Esau seems to be shooting himself in the leg over here. His whole um, uh, sort of, he's all gung ho, okay, I'm going to leave and not take part in having to pay the debt of being stranger in a foreign land. Okay, so I'm going to be a stranger in a foreign land. This has got to be like reminiscent of some like Polish joke or something, you know, like, the, the, the Helmite, you know, like, what are you doing? You, you, you're trying to make sure you're not going to be um, part of paying the debt. So what are you doing? You're moving out of the land of Canaan. But, of course, the explanation is somewhat obvious. The decree opposed upon Yitzchak offspring was that they would be strangers in a land that is not theirs, meaning in the land they would inhabit, they would be considered strangers and not residents, right? The whole idea is the whole time that the Jews are in Egypt, they don't belong there. They're not Right, they, they don't assimilate, and in fact, that's to our credit. That's the reward which we don't assimilate, we don't change our name, we don't change our language, we don't, right? Never mind all the suffering and the anguish and the, and the slavery, but we're, we're strangers, we're not assimilating. Asov doesn't want to pay, um, did not want to pay the debt contract and live as a stranger, and instead, the Torah writes explicitly, Asov specifically settled on how to say it, right. What does it say in verse 8? Esau's, so Esau dwelt. He went to settle in the land of Seir. Esau wasn't a stranger in the land of Seir. Seir now becomes Esau's headquarters. I have abandoning Canaan, lock, stock, and barrel. I'm going to move to Seir. That's my place now. And therefore, taking that into account, this serves as a lesson for us. The narrative serves as a lesson to each and every person in their avoda, whether they, wherever they may be throughout the time of Golos. While we are in Golis paying the debt, paying the debt that we have to be in Golis, for whatever reason, Hashem, this is not the Golis of Mitzrayim. But this is the mission that Hashem wants, wants us to endure, to brighten up Golis, to brighten up the world, to bring Mashiach. Until the coming of Mashiach, who will, who will fight Sorry, until the coming of the Mashiach, who will fight the wars of Hashem and be victorious, build a temple in its place, and then gather the dispersed of Israel, the end of exile, right? This is paraphrasing from the Rambam um, of what Mashiach is. So, in, But until Mashiach comes, we're paying a debt. We're in Golis. It's really important that we know and feel that we are no more than strangers in a foreign country. A person should not feel settled, God forbid, in the times and the norms of Golis. I think the, the, the word norms here. Is a footnote here. In the Hebrew, Seder HaGolos, the order of exile. I think that's really important because it's not just about don't feel at home in Chicago. Don't feel at home in a Golos mentality. We, we, we have to realize that the fact that we're in a Golos mentality, that we, whatever that entails, that we have to, that there's so many mitzvahs that we're not able to do, that our 
dedication to Torah and mitzvahs takes so much struggle and it's not obvious to us and not, um, not sort of automatic to us of our relationship with Hashem and everything else that the concealment that of Golos entails, we have to make sure not to become comfortable with that. We must be a stranger foreign to all the elements of Golos. Where do we want to be a resident? We have to be a resident in Eretz Yisrael, and that means in Avodah, we must be a resident and strong in all matters of Torah and Mitzvahs, matters of the Neshama, which at the outset have never gone into Golos. In other words, our Mitzvahs, our mit, our mit, when we do a Mitzvah, when we learn Torah and we connect with Hashem, that's when we experience Gula. That has to be done as a resident. But when you say that bad some you have better TV shows to watch, that's where we're not supposed to be comfortable. That's where we're a stranger. We're foreign. We're foreign to TV shows. A person should await the true redemption by a righteous Mashiach at all times and every moment. Never become comfortable. We will lead us. We are the Chenu, Kenemir Sartenu, Ukarev, Damash. Okay. So um, we'll stop right here. Let me turn off the recording. Hold on.